A uh, 70-year-old gentleman was referred to us uh, for endosonography for obstructive jaundice. patient has severe cholestatic symptoms and was uh, suspected to have a lower bile duct block on other imaging studies without definitive diagnosis. So as I had discussed earlier in a few cases, a standard protocol, uh, EUS, mapping of the pancreobiliary anatomy and pathology followed by a definitive intervention. You can see the dilated bile duct, uh, periampillary tumor, occluding the lower CBD you can see here. Uh, in, uh, it could be arising from the pancreatic head and there's absolutely no doubt the lesion is appearing uh, fairly resectable as uh, and none of the major vessels are close to the primary lesion, as you can see here in scanning. However, minimal free fluid was seen. You can see in the pericholecystic area, uh, minimal free fluid was noted, and there were few lymph nodes also we saw. Uh, you can see the lesion very well now, uh, and its uh, dimensions are somewhere around uh, uh, 2.5 centimeters by 2.8 centimeters and it's our experience that any tumor beyond 2.5 centimeters uh, has you can see the dilated pancreatic duct I'm still sitting in the duodenum you can see the free fluid pocket at 12 o'clock position uh, this heralds uh, a very early peritoneal dissemination of course it can be debated whether we always need to do any USFNA of the small pocket of fluid but when we know that these patients uh, are highly comorbidities and for definitive uh, palliation, diagnosis and staging, uh, it does not really matter. You can see the mildly prominent pancreatic duct here in the body of the pancreas. Uh, we'll ev evaluate any pancreatobiliary tumor if we have a celiac axis lymph node or not as a standard protocol. Uh, we need to see celiac axis. A celiac artery area. Uh, we are trying to see the celiac artery and uh, this is the celiac artery area. You can see small round sub-centimeter hypoechoic nodes. Now people can definitely debate whether these are reactive nodes secondary to cholangitis or these are definitive metastatic nodes. Um, it's our experience, uh, you know, 5 mm node, we have done an FNA and they turn out to be metastatic. So this is the new thinking. I personally reckon that uh, the world will have to follow perhaps in times to come when more centers starts doing EUS routinely for all pancreatic cancers worldwide. Uh, you can see here this is the aorta at uh, 5 and 6 o'clock position. That's the standard position we keep for mediastinal evaluation. And as I withdraw, I'm seeing sub-centimeter lymph nodes in the supra diaphragmatic subcarinal perisophageal uh, periaortic region. These are round hypoechoic nodes, mind you. So we need to really l look into this uh, science uh, of uh, staging uh, any pancreatobiliary cancer before um, uh, definitive treatment. And I personally reckon that tumors which are deemed resectable on uh, conventional imaging, including PET CT scan, uh, should undergo an endoscopic ultrasound uh, prior to a definitive resection or treatment, because you may pick up small lymph nodes which can influence the, the staging as well as eventual outcome. You can see here the tumor is brought between 5 and 7 o'clock position. Once again, we are using a s gentle jab uh, with a very small 25 gauge needle um, and uh, we will de-plug the needle uh, with the stylet and uh, it's our standard technique uh, over the last 7,500 FNAs that we have done and learned lessons out of it that there is no need to really wriggle your needle very aggressively in the lesion because that can lead to a lot of blood so very gentle to and fro, very, very gentle maneuver of the needle within the tumor up to the periphery of the lesion. Uh, we stay there for about 30, 45, 30 to 45 seconds and that's end of the procedure and this is enough material we have aspirated out of the lesion. Now as I mentioned, uh, whenever we have a pancreatic head or periampillary lesion, 
uh, there is a resultant periampillary edema due to obstruction of lymphatic channels. And you can see here significant periampillary lymphedema uh, leading to uh, impossible cannulation uh, even and the deformity in that region. So we do try certain techniques, but then uh, it really doesn't work always. So we change our technique here. We are doing a pre-cut with a sphincterotome now. So what I did, I know that this could be pancreatic duct. We know that there is a pancreatic head tumor. Uh, and uh, that pancreatic duct tumor is occluding the pancreatic duct anyway. And there is severe deformity, and no way I will be able to find the right plane uh, to cut in the axis of the, of the bile duct. So I managed to engage the catheter and de-roof uh, the opening. So we know that there is somewhere is the opening, and we have de-roofed the, the topmost layer. Now, once we have done this with a conventional sphincterotome, I can see some opening there, some bulges. So very gently, we will take a needle knife sphincterotome and then uh, peel the onion of the, of the ampulla. You can see here, very gentle maneuvers. A very gentle cut here, we know. And then I'm using uh, a specially designed uh, biliary dilator, a seven French taper tip with a terumo, because sometimes these tumors are extremely tight and very, very uh, sclerotic in order to negotiate. So here you can see that our guide wire has gone deep in the intrahepatic biliary system. We always make sure that we are in the IHBR and not in the gallbladder and then inject contrast. You can see that the entire biliary system, you can see the cystic duct take off there. Uh, so it is important for you to uh, ascertain that you are right in the intrahepatic biliary system. We are evaluating the stricture also. You can see the lower bile duct completely occluded with the neoplastic process on cholangiogram. And then we exchange the terumo for a stiffer guide wire um, once we have obtained a cholangiogram. So this is our standard practice. Uh, you can see dark bile uh, coming out. Now this patient, uh, as you can see, has uh, minimal free fluid. You can see the brush. It's a standard practice uh, because of our study protocol that every patient with obstructive jaundice, we will do EUSFNA as well as brushing. Uh, and we have compared our data, and I think uh, there is no doubt that EUSFNA is much, much superior and more accurate. And I think slowly and surely, as more centers starts doing EUSFNA routinely, uh, the practice will change uh, uh, significantly. So in this case, though ideally this patient warrants a metal stent, but because of uh, certain uh, socioeconomic uh, reasons, uh, patients' relatives uh, insisted to have a plastic stent as they think uh, that they need to evaluate this patient for resection if required. Uh, so I said, perfectly, it's fine. So we placed uh, a catheter, and over the catheter, uh, a 10 French uh, Teflon stent. Now, I prefer Teflon stents purely because of the stiffness of the stent. And I think PTFE stents are not, or polyurethane stents are not very, uh, very good in certain situations when the strictures are too tight. So I personally feel that this kind of stents can take any severity of stricture, any sclerotic nature of the stricture, and uh, it slides easily. Again, Teflon stents have low coefficient of friction, uh, in, and therefore the occlusion uh, rate is. Uh, comparatively lower than the uh, routine plastic stents. 